Hey guys, today I'm reading Bad Princess, and I'm reading, and I'm reading chapter three. I'm reading chapter three, part four. Okay, I'm reading chapter three, part four. Okay. Darius, the ultimate wedding gift. Remember our old friend Salakwa, which let boys inherit thrones and turn girls into pawns on the royal. Wait. Uh huh. Dowry is the ultimate wedding gift. Remember our old friend Salakla, which let which let boys inherit thrones and turn the girls into pawns on the royal marriage market. Here's another reason folks wanted a princess bride. They became. Uh, wait, not they became. Um, yeah. they came bearing a dowry, wealth bestowed, uh, wealth bestowed the bride's family estate. Uh, though it's tempting to think of dowries as Salik Law's consolation prize for being a born female, dowries are very different from inheritances. For starters, dowries aren't bestowed at death, only at marriage. Dowries also predate Salak law. The Code of Hammurabi, a system of laws from ancient Mesopotamia, states that the dowry remained property of the bride and could only be inherited by her children from the marriage. However, in ancient Rome, the dowry was transferred directly to the husband's family. Whatever the culture, the main purpose of the dowry was to ensure girls went into their marriage with some financial security. They also helped set up the newly married couple's financial security. They also helped set up the newly, uh, newly married couple's household. Dowries still exist today in some cultures and countries. While a dowry could be comprised of money, as in the case of Louis, Louis the Fourteenth's founding daughters. It could also include property, land, housing, jewels, linens, and domesticated animals, herds of cows, anyone. A gen- generous dowry could even make, even help make less than fetching bride more appealing to suitors. Sounds harsh, right? But remember, marriage then wasn't about love. It was about the consolidation of power and property. Well, that's where I'm going to end for now. Bye, guys.